Oh, it looks like it's started already. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Schoops today. Uh, Mark is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and is a visiting professor in the journalism school at, you know, at the UC Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism, uh, where he basically leads the school's investigative reporting initiatives. So over his career, Mark has edited Chicago's Lesbian and Gay News Weekly, the Windy City, City Times, where he successfully created for gay rights. He won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on AIDS in Africa at New York's famed The Village Voice. Uh, he shared in another Pulitzer Prize at the Wall Street Journal for reporting from ground zero on the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Uh, and he served as editor at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative reporting and launched and led the investigative team at BuzzFeed's New, BuzzFeed News, uh, building that team from zero to more than 20 reporters. Uh, and that you know included two Pulitzer finalist honors. Uh, he returned to BuzzFeed News as editor-in-chief, overseeing a Pulitzer Prize winning investigation into Chinese detention camps in Xinjiang and a Pulitzer finalist investigation into global money laundering. And as head of news for BuzzFeed, he also oversaw a second new organization, HuffPost. Uh, and I also you know, want to point out that you know, one of the reasons he's giving this talk today is because he's really interested in working with people here at ISI in developing tools and techniques for working on investigative journalism. And so I thought it'd be great to have him come with a talk. He can tell you about what he does and what the opportunities are. And then we can look for opportunities for collaboration. So I'm very pleased to turn it over to Mark. Okay, fantastic. Um, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you, Craig, for inviting me to speak. And thanks also to Emilio Ferrara for working with Craig and me on a new collaboration between ISI and the USC Annenberg School of Journalism. Thank you to Muhao Chen and to Moira Corbacci and her team for organizing today's talk. And most of all, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to listen. I hope that my talk will inspire you to think about how the astonishing skills you have might strengthen one of the main pillars of our democracy, which is investigative reporting. Now, what actually is investigative reporting? It's journalism that penetrates the most fiercely guarded secrets, revealing wrongdoing, abuse of power, betrayals of trust. It does so rigorously using documents, data, and digital forensics to prove beyond any doubt that what it has uncovered is true. And as such, I believe it is the most potent antidote to the disinformation that is flooding our culture. Finally, investigative reporting does real good in the world. Investigative projects that I've worked on, either as a reporter or an editor, have freed dozens of con wrongly convicted people from prison. It's changed laws that protect battered women, that ensure the rights of LGBTQ people, and that have cracked down on global money laundering. Our stories have gotten sexual abusers fired from their jobs, pushed drug companies to lower the price of life-saving AIDS medications in the developing world, and stopped an incompetent surgeon from butchering his patients. So, how do we choose our stories? We look for stories that expose big problems. I often say that there are basically two kinds of investigative stories, bodies harmed or money stolen. So bodies harmed can be anything from war crimes to bad medical care, to police shootings, to Me Too harassment. Money stolen is often fraud, but it can also be wage theft from low-income workers or price collusion by big corporations. Finally, investigative stories are best if you can show that the perpetrator is not just one bad apple. I'm sure that many of you saw the movie Spotlight, which is about the Boston Globe's famous investigation that revealed how the Catholic Church covered up sexual abuse by priests. 
Now, in that movie, the editor tells the reporters that finding just one or two priests who had abused children was not that great of an investigative story. What made the Globe story powerful was showing that the Catholic hierarchy knew that priests were sexually abusing children, covered it up, and let them keep on abusing. That's what made it a great story. So we look for systemic harm or harm perpetrated by powerful people or institutions against vulnerable. Now, how do we do our reporting? How do we find this stuff out? There are four main methods. The first is what we call shoe leather reporting. To get the story, we call often hundreds of people, hundreds of potential sources, only a few of whom usually agree to speak with us. When we cannot reach people by phone, we go to their homes or their offices in person, and we knock on the door and we ask them to speak, which often, by the way, works. They will often speak to us in person when they won't speak to us over the phone. And we go to places. We go to crime scenes. We go to unsafe factories that endanger workers' lives. We go to mass graves to witness and to observe firsthand to find evidence. Okay, then there are documents. You've all heard of this. Of course, the Pentagon Papers, for example, which showed that America's leaders knew that the war in Vietnam was going badly, but lied about its process, progress to the American people. Or the Snowden Letter, which contained reports and memos detailing an unprecedented digital dragnet that surveilled almost every American. The third is data, and I hardly need to tell you that we live in an era of big data. And combing through that data can lead to all kinds of great investigations. So one of the data reporters whom I hired and supervised at BuzzFeed News analyzed publicly available betting data to figure out which tennis players were most likely to be fixing matches. Our story, which was tweeted by Andy Murray and all kinds of other top name tennis players, sparked an investigation that forced the international tennis body to strengthen its monitoring of corruption and match fixing. And we got that story by simply analyzing the way people placed bets on tennis matches. And today, there's a whole new method of investigative reporting, digital forensics. And this method of reporting is so new that it doesn't yet have a generally agreed on name. Some people call it open source reporting or OSINT, which is short for open source intelligence. Because it often uses photos or videos, the New York Times calls it visual investigations and the Washington Post calls it visual forensics. The basic idea is this, in almost everything that all of us do, we emit digital traces. On our phones, we take countless photos and videos, many of which we upload to social media. Satellites constantly generate photographs, infrared imagery, and other kinds of sensory data. On the road, license plate readers and carpool lane monitors record when we drive past them. We email, text, and call all through digital means. Stock trades, flight paths, shipping manifests, workplace inspection reports, all of those are now digital and their traces linger online, on servers and inside of devices. And for investigative reporters, such information can be evidence. Just look at how the New York Times and the digital forensics organizations Bellingcat identified Jack Tahera, the young airman who leaked classified information about the Russia-Ukraine war. Now this airman photographed some of the classified documents and the edges of those photos showed a granite countertop and a tile floor, which reporters matched to photographs posted on social media of the Tahera home. Now, in our time, Documents, data, and digital forensics 
are all blending together. Documents are mostly digital. They're PDFs or Word docs or whatever. Data has long been digitized. So what most, or so much of what investigative reporters do now is identify, obtain, and analyze digital information. And in many cases, we need to partner with you or people with your skills to do our job. And that's especially true when there is a lot of information that people cannot sort through manually. So ISI and Annenberg are collaborating on a new partnership. And here are the main parts of the vision that Craig, Emilio, and I have for the ISI Annenberg partnership. The first is for ISI researchers to build general capabilities that would be of wide use to journalists. The second is to work with individual journalists who are deep in an important investigation and need custom built tools or capabilities. And the last is to train and mentor a few high caliber journalists who want to become better and more sophisticated engineers so that they can build their own custom tools for their newsrooms. Now, to state something that is probably obvious, but that I should make explicit, we do not hack into other people's computers or servers. Journalists cannot and do not steal information. We obtain our information lawfully and ethically by downloading it from the internet, or by requesting it from institutions or people that own it, or by obtaining it from whistleblowers or sources. And what I'm going to do now is take you inside a few investigations to show you how they were conducted. And I hope that by seeing the inside of investigations, it will spark ideas for how your skills might help investigative reporters use digital information to expose important truths. Let's start with an investigation that I know really well because I oversaw it as editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed News. One of our reporters, Mega Rajagopalan, had reported from China. Now, back in 2017, she was the first Western journalist to go to the Xinjiang region and visit a detention center for Uyghur Muslims. This photograph shows that detention center. And like many of the early detention centers, it was a repurposed building, in this case, a school. Uh, and by the way, that propaganda poster on the wall that you see, it says, cherish ethnic unity as you cherish your own eyes. Now, China did not like Mega's reporting. So when her visa expired, the Chinese authorities refused to renew it, and she had to leave China. She has never been able to go back. But she kept wondering about all those Uyghurs who were being persecuted. Reports have estimated that over the years of China's crackdown, a million Uyghurs have been detained at one point or another making it the largest scale detention of ethnic and religious minorities since World War II. So where was China putting all these people? Where were these detention camps and what were they like? She decided to examine satellite imagery to find them. To do that, she teamed up with a licensed architect and investigative journalist named Allison Killing, who specializes in analyzing satellite imagery of buildings, and Christo Buschek, who calls himself an investigative engineer. Let me just repeat that term, investigative engineer, especially as AI advances so rapidly now, journalism is going to need investigative engineers. But there was a fourth person who also deserves credit for helping our team, and that is Xi Jinping, president of the People's Republic of China. You see, the Xinjiang region is almost four times the size of California. There is no way we could manually search through all the satellite imagery covering so much territory. 
But Xi Jinping, or at least his security obsessed censors, provided a clue. On Baidu maps, certain tiles of satellite imagery were blocked out. These masked tiles were light gray squares, different from the darker gray watermarked tiles that appear when Baidu cannot load something. And these masked tiles were present at locations where detention camps had previously been visited and verified by journalists. Put in place by Xi's security forces to censor the web, these masked tiles instead led us directly to sensitive sites. Now, in truth, it was a bit more complicated. Baidu's satellite map of Xinjiang contains 55 million tiles. So Crispo, the investigative engineer, wrote a program to scrape Baidu for only the mass tiles and their location. Christo's scraper ran on 25 servers in parallel for over six weeks. And to fool Baidu and prevent getting blocked, Christo had to slow down the scrape and introduce random behavior. Now, China censors so many sites that after we had finished the scrape, Christo had found about 5 million masked tiles, which is still way, way too many to go through by hand. But our reporters knew that detention camps have to be near towns because camps need electricity and plumbing and they employ guards who have, need to have places to live and schools to educate their children and all of that. So by focusing our search near towns, the reporters were able to zero in on a much smaller number of censored tiles. Then our reporters looked at those locations with imagery from sites that Xi Jinping could not censor, Google Maps, Sentinel, and Planet Maps. What they found was stunning. In little more than four years, China had built more than 260 structures bearing the hallmarks of fortified detention compounds. Some of these were huge, capable of holding 10,000 people. 176 of these camps had never been publicly identified. We were the first to let the world know that they existed. The satellite imagery revealed incredible detail, such as thick fortified walls, guard towers, barbed wire pens in courtyards where detainees were occasionally brought out to exercise, a passage leading from a guardhouse to the main accommodation building, the color of the outside walls. By counting the windows along the facade and then subtracting space for stairwells and other features, Allison, the architect, could estimate with a high degree of confidence how many cells were on each floor. Videos smuggled out of other camps corroborated Allison's analysis, and reporters also obtained public documents setting forth construction standards, everything from the size of the bars on the windows to the height of the watchtowers. We used all these sources and methods to analyze the camps and build 3D models. Now, China does not just deprive Uyghurs of their freedom, it uses them as cheap labor. At least 135 of the camps hold factories which likely include forced prison labor. We identified factories by using the same kind of forensics that we use to identify the detention facilities. And again, China helped us out by topping most of the factory buildings with distinctive blue roofs, as you can see in this photo. Finally, and crucially, our reporters flew to Kazakhstan and interviewed 28 former prisoners, such as this woman. She and others told us about their ordeals and also helped us to map out the detention centers. For example, when we showed them models or blueprints we had generated based on satellite imagery, they were able to confirm or correct details. Not long after our series was published, a person who gives his name as Guan Guan 
drove through Xinjiang and filmed more than 15 of the structures we identified as internment camps. And he uploaded his video to YouTube. He explicitly said he was doing this because foreign reporters cannot go to Xinjiang, but he could, which suggests that he is from China or perhaps Hong Kong. His video showed that what our reporters identified as detention camps were exactly that. Here is a satellite photo alongside an image from Guan Guan's video. The sign near the gate identifies the place as the 13th Division Detention Center. In this slide, you can see that what Allison identified as guard towers on the satellite photo are indeed guard towers. Altogether, the new permanent and fortified detention camps that we documented in the Xinjiang region cover 206 million square feet. How many prisoners can China fit into such a vast archipelago of camps? We know from our interviews with former prisoners and by, from reporting by other news organizations that China's detention centers in Xinjiang are overcrowded, crammed with far more prisoners than the official regulations call for. But by conservative sticking to China's official regulations of how many prisoners its detention camps are supposed to hold, we determined that China's newly built detention camps in Xinjiang can hold one million prisoners at once. One million at the same time. That's about one in every 25 residents of Xinjiang. For those sweeping and detailed revelations of one of the world's gravest human rights violations, mega Allison and Christo won the Pulitzer Prize. Now, I believe that you, the faculty, researchers, and doctoral students of ISI, could have helped us immensely with this project. In fact, I think you could have even helped us more than Xi Jinping and his censorship tiles. If we had provided you with imagery of some known detention center, could you have taught AI to sift through all the buildings in Xinjiang and identify those with the hallmarks of prison and detention camps, thick perimeter walls, guard towers, and so forth? AI has been used to search satellite imagery and to find, for example, illegal airstrips in the Amazon, airstrips that are almost always near toxic and polluting mines. This was done by the New York Times uh, and some other groups uh, in collaboration with the Times. But an airstrip in the Amazon looks like a red dirt rectangle cut out of a dark green rainforest. So it's relatively simple to identify. Picking out detention centers is probably much more complex. On the other hand, you are the world's best, so maybe you could teach AI to find them. I have a wish list of things that I'd like AI to find. For example, by combing through satellite photos, LIDAR, multispectral imagery, and remote thermal sensing, could you identify plots of specific crops or vegetation, for example, opium, over some vast landmass? If we had the right sensors, could we analyze the atmosphere to detect specific pollutants or harmful chemicals? Could we use AI to find freshly dug mass graves? I'm sure that you folks probably have great ideas on what AI could find by scanning satellite imagery. I want to turn now to another very common type of investigation, which is recreating a crime spatially and chronologically to discover exactly what happened microsecond by microsecond. This type of investigation is usually based on video and photographs taken by cell phone, surveillance camera, and police body cams. And you have surely seen variations of this, such as the many reconstructions of what happened at the United States Capitol on January 6th, or the murder of George Floyd or other police killers. 
What I will show you now is a short video clip of an investigation done by Forensic Architecture, a group that specializes in reconstructing physical space from photographs and videos, and al Haq, a Palestinian human rights group. They investigated the killing of an Al Jazeera journalist and United States citizen named Shireen Abu Akleh. They showed that she was shot by an Israeli sniper and their reconstruction will show you the scene from the point of view of the sniper who pulled the trigger. For some people, this might be difficult to watch. So if you choose to turn off your video, the clip lasts just a little bit over two minutes. And here it is. We undertook an extensive drone survey to construct a precise 3D photogrammetry scan of the scene. We located all cameras within the model and reconstructed the precise positions of the journalists at important points throughout the incident. As they were walking towards the IOF's position and identifying themselves as journalists, as the IOF fired the first round at them, as the second round of shooting began and we last see Shireen alive, after Shireen has been shot and is lying on the ground. We also identified and reconstructed the precise position of the Israeli forces, a convoy of five armored vehicles seen here three minutes before the shooting. We identified the armored vehicle from which Shireen was shot. It was parked sideways with a shooting hole here. The bullet retrieved from Shireen's head has a green tip and is a common type of ammunition used by IOF marksmen. IOF marksmen typically use an optical scope that is mounted on their M4 assault rifles and magnifies their vision four times. This is the opening for the scope. We simulated how Shireen and the other journalists would appear from the marksman's position 190 meters away. According to the model, this is what the marksmen would have seen when they began shooting. The journalists' press vests would have been clearly visible, here and throughout the incident. We were able to verify their visibility by placing a camera with a telephoto lens at the precise position of the marksman and taking a photograph at four times magnification, indicating what the marksman would have seen through the scope. The journalists were clearly identifiable as such. We reconstructed Ali's position when he was shot and the bullet's point of impact, as well as Shireen's position and the point of impact when she was shot and killed. When the marksman shot Shireen, she was turned away from them with her press vest in full view. We also identified the impact of four... <clears throat> So you can clearly see how reconstructing the, uh, the space in 3D helps journalists and others to understand exactly what happened. So as you can imagine, reporters often need to re have to reconstruct three-dimensional models from two-dimensional photographs and video. And what I've been told is that most of the available photogrammetry software produces very detailed 3D models which is great, but those software packages typically require lots of images, and sometimes we don't have lots of images. So here is another thing journalists would like. Could you develop software that uses just a small number of images or videos to construct a rough 3D model that reporters could then manually refine as they obtain more information? And here's something else that journalists could use. Reporters often get a large batch of photos and videos that show the same scene. Think of January 6th, for example. And often only a few of those images have metadata showing the time when they were taken and the geographical location where they were taken. Many of the images that we end up collecting have no such metadata, or in some cases, the metadata is incorrect. So could we have software that would place a given set of images in relation to each other in both space and time? In other words, could we create a chronology 
placing each image at its precise point along the timeline? And also, could we create a three-dimensional map placing each image at its precise location in space, even if those images and video don't have metadata? And yet another item on my wish list, could we develop the capability to automatically geolocate a photo or video? For example, if I have a photo that shows the hills outside my window or maybe some buildings, is there a way to automate geolocating that, locating where that photograph was taken? Those are just a few general ideas of, of, of general tools that journalists could use. Now, the way investigations actually work in the real world is that reporters go down rabbit holes. They pursue deep, narrow, and very specific lines of investigation. So often there is no tool that does what they need to do and they must build a custom tool. I'm just gonna give you one example of this. You may have seen the New York Times astonishing video based on digital forensics that proved that Russia's 234th Air Assault Regiment, which is an elite paratrooper unit, killed civilians and committed other war crimes in Bucha, Ukraine. In its investigation, the Times used many, many different types of evidence from surveillance camera video and audio to cell phone video to actual paper documents. But the Times also obtained from the Ukrainian government metadata on about 400,000 cell phone calls placed from the Bucha area over the time that the Russians occupied the town. Now, Russian soldiers often loot the cell phones from the dead bodies of the Ukrainian civilians they have murdered and then use those stolen phones to call home. As you can see from this video clip, that's a powerful piece of evidence linking members of the 234th paratrooper unit to atrocities in Bucha. Let's watch. On top of the commander call signs we heard earlier, rank and file soldiers from the unit took cell phones from these two checkpoint guards and used them to call home. In the case of this victim, Vitaly Karpenko, call logs we obtained from the Ukrainian authorities show that his phone made eight calls to Russia. The first was placed within six hours of his execution. To identify the Russian soldier who made this call, we took the number in Russia that he dialed and found a social media profile linked to it. We searched the profile for relatives who were men of military age and found the soldier. We also called the number that the soldier dialed and spoke to a relative who confirmed his name and unit. Vladimir Vasiliev, a member of the 234th. Vladimir also used the phone of another checkpoint guard, Ivan Skiba. Ivan's phone was passed around to at least 15 other soldiers and, one after the other, they made 38 calls to Russia. We have confirmed that most of these soldiers were in the same unit, the 234th. While we don't know that these soldiers pulled the trigger, their calls back home within hours of an execution implicate their unit in these killings. So in that clip, you heard a bit about how the Times identified the Russian soldiers from the calls, but I wanna take you even deeper inside how the Times did its research. Part of the way they did it is that an investigative engineer at the Times took the calls made to the Russian numbers, then developed software to scrape social media profiles associated with the Russian numbers that the Ukrainian cell phones had called. That narrowed it down to a somewhat manageable number of profiles, which, as you heard, reporters examined for military-aged men and links to their social media accounts. But the investigative engineer also scraped a popular Russian social media platform known as Vukontakta for videos of military training exercises. Then he extracted the faces from those videos 
and match them with faces from the database of soldiers assembled from the phone numbers. And that turned up more matches of soldiers from the 234. And finally, as you heard, reporters from the New York Times did the old fashioned kind of reporting, which is calling those Russian numbers, speaking with relatives who often confirmed the names, of the soldiers and their unit, the 234. So that's just one fairly simple example of the kind of rabbit hole that reporters end up going down and how engineering can help. Part of our vision for the ISI Annenberg Partnership is that when reporters on a big, important investigation hit some complex problem, that they could bring that problem to us to see if some of you could help solve the problem and advance their investigation or that they could learn from you how to solve the problem on their own. And believe me, there are already reporters at major news organizations who are salivating at the prospect. I wanna close by talking about the culture in which investigative reporting tools would be used. And why? Because it's people who use tools and the best tools embody the values and practices and cultures of the human beings who use them. The old image of a lone reporter uncovering a massive scandal is sometimes still true, but it's rare. These days, journalism is a team sport, so tools must allow for easy collaboration. And of course, collaboration usually means communicating over the internet, so journalists need to protect their sources and data. And that means the tools need to be secure. For sensitive investigations, we don't dare use Google Docs or Google Sheets because our data will be on Google servers. Christo, the brilliant investigative engineer who worked on our Xinjiang series, wants a simple tabular tool, a spreadsheet basically, that is collaborative and secure. Beyond the tools and capabilities I've already mentioned, here are a few other ideas I've received from talking to journalists I know, and quite frankly, by reading the work that, or reading about some of the work that you have done. Maybe these ideas and others I've mentioned will spark your interest in, in building these capabilities or adapting what you have already developed. So AI will flood the world with disinformation and falsehoods. It's already beginning to do that. Some of these lies will be in the form of text, others in the form of images, videos, or audio. I know that some of you have already developed software that can identify imagery that has been manipulated. Is it possible to develop capabilities to detect image or videos that have been generated by AI or manipulated by it in some way? More broadly, can we investigate AI itself in the pre-AI era, journalists exposed how algorithms can cause harm. For example, some predictive policing algorithms that purport to identify who will become a criminal or who should be sentenced more harshly have been shown to be grossly inaccurate and often to encode society's larger racial biases. Journalists were unable, sorry, journalists were able to unpack those algorithms and show how those formulas worked. But how does AI actually work? I keep reading that AI is a black box, that we do not know how AI produces the effects that we see. And maybe that's true. Maybe that black box is absolutely impenetrable. But journalists would be very interested in any way of shining a light into that black box so that we can examine and learn how AI is shaping our world for better or for worse. One of the biggest stories that I ever was involved with involved more than 100 newsrooms around the globe. It was based on a massive probe of financial documents that a whistleblower had given to one of my reporters showing how big banks, big banks themselves, suspected that money flowing through some of their accounts 
was tied to terrorists, drug kingpins, and other criminals, and yet they just kept processing the money and collecting the fees. Now, this trove of documents that we got, it was the equivalent of 14 copies of Moby Dick. That's a lot of words and a lot of information to sift through. So here's a capability that ISI researchers have already developed that could be repurposed for journalists. The concept is to take many different kinds of documents, PDFs, Word documents, spreadsheets, JSONs, and God only knows what all else, and collate them into a database that can be analyzed, especially for link analysis. Journalists would love that, especially if it were collaborative and secure. Now, finding an investigative story, figuring out what to look at, what to investigate, what to examine is hard. And it's something that Alex Spanger and I have talked about several times. There is no one way that journalists find stories. John Kerryrew, for example, who is the reporter who took down Elizabeth Holmes and her company Theranos, got onto the story because he read a short article in the New Yorker magazine that could not explain how the company's supposedly revolutionary blood testing technology worked. And John just thought that was odd. So he began looking into the company and its technology, which led to his incredible investigation. We did a massive Pulitzer finalist story about Russian assassinations on Western soil and we got onto that one by sheer luck. A source called up one of our reporters and offered her 256 boxes of documents as well as some hard drives and phones. So there's no single way that reporters find stories. But there might be ways to, automating, to automate finding some types of stories, such as fraud and misconduct among big companies. For example, one of the stories that we did was investigate the country's largest psychiatric hospital chain, finding terrible, terrible things that they were doing. What got us onto that story was by looking at the company's SEC filings and noticing one line that said the company was being investigated by the Department of Justice. So could we train AI to sift through SEC filings and perhaps related corporate and financial information to flag companies that seem suspicious or that are under investigation by federal authorities or that bear the hallmarks of companies that have previously gone under or been found to have committed fraud? Could we build a similar capability to sift through hearings by legislative committees and regulatory bodies? both the transcripts and the videos, and perhaps combine that with campaign contribution data to find newsworthy nuggets or the hallmarks of corruption or backscratching. I'm told that one researcher who has built something like this for a California newsroom found that the same person would testify to different legislative committees using different names, which is something you might want to follow up on. And finally, I've read how Mayank Tedgerwal, and I hope I'm pronouncing that name right, here, that they're at ISI, helped to build DIG, which is an AI tool for fighting human trafficking. As I understand it from my reading, DIG scours the web for digital breadcrumbs scattered in sex ads, allowing investigators to find victims and shut down sex rings. Could something like that be adapted for other purposes to find labor trafficking, which is a huge and underreported problem, or financial fraud or something else. These are just a few examples of capabilities that would strengthen investigative reporting. And I put up a slide here with some of those capabilities that we've discussed, and I hope that they will spark ideas. And in closing, I'd like to reiterate the vision that Craig, Emilio, and I have for our partnership. It's for ISI to build some general capabilities that would be of wide use to journalists, to work with 
particular journalists who are deep in an important investigation who need custom tools. And it's to train and mentor outstanding journalists who want to become better and more sophisticated investigative engineers. I hope that you will take down my email. It's shooks at usc.edu because I would love to hear from you and to work with you. And I'd like to give a big thanks to the people who helped me prepare this investigation, including Craig, Emilio, Mega, Allison, Christo, Malachi Brown of the New York Times, Kevin Reyes of ISD, who will be teaching digital forensics at Annenberg in the fall, and to my husband, Jorge, who has been the one actually showing you all the slides and videos today. Say hi, Jorge. Um, and most of all, again, thank you to all of you for listening. And I am happy to take any questions or comments or listen to any thoughts that people have. Um, so I'll stop there. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, really fascinating talk and lots of interesting ideas to follow up on. So let's open up for questions. So uh, people who are panelists can either just raise your hand or just speak up and ask questions. Attendees can post your questions in the chat and I can read them to Mark. So uh, anyone have any questions to start? So I'll, I'll start, Mark. I have a question for you, which is, so you, you spent a lot of time talking about all these visual tools, which seem really important. And you, you talked a little bit on some other things and stuff, but it strikes me that in a lot of these investigations, it's gonna be some combination of the visual tools, uh, looking at documents like text information, data. And I suspect that a lot of it's just done manually today. Yes, uh, I mean, but but I imagine there's a whole range of tools that that would really come into play, and that would be, you would just use them at all stages in the process, right? That they would. I think that's true, especially for those general capability tools that I was talking about. You know, can we collect, for example, all that kind of information in one database and allow us to? Um, quickly and efficiently sift through it and find commonalities, find links. Does this phone number link to that um, bank account or, or, or what have you? Um, so yes, I think that doing that is, is important. And also one of the things that I don't know whether we would be able to solve, but is a, is a real issue, is that when journalists use different tools, they often don't talk to each other very well. Hmm. And that can be even in the same realm. Hmm. So for, to give you one example that I, that I know to be true, uh, journalists on one of these investigations that was trying to reconstruct what, uh, there, there, was a, there was a very uh, sad and tragic case where migrants trying to enter Europe um, sort of uh, basically stormed a checkpoint and 28 people died. And so the journalists tried to reconstruct exactly what happened in the way that, that the, the, the sniper that I showed you was sort of reconstructed. And they would very carefully geolocate an image, but another journalist may have been using another tool. And when they tried to move the geolocated image to the other tool, it would sometimes show up a hundred miles away. <laughs> And so these tools do not often talk to one another very well. And so that's a, that, that's a common issue that people have when they are collaborating. And, um, and that's something that probably would be more specific to a particular investigation, but something to bear in mind. Right. I imagine there's sort of general things that you could do to make those tools more collaborative with each other. Even if it's yes, that might be true. And again, I should also say I am not an engineer. I am not a coder. So I have a general understanding as a layman, but I do not have the kind of understanding that all of you uh, watching this do. Um, I think somebody has raised their hand. It looks like. Yeah, Emilio has his hand up. So Emilio. Yeah, Mark, I was going to say, first of all, thank you for the phenomenal uh, talk. I mean, I, I knew a good amount of these things but you know listening to you presenting and the details and sort of like understanding the impact is kind of mind mind-boggling um i think you gave a really good summary of all the um tools and perhaps techniques and so on that uh, are utilized in this type of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of investigations um 
but at some point you, you mentioned also that perhaps there are stories about the you know artificial intelligence systems and models that are already affecting society and that are perhaps yeah. already generating I don't know biased or unfair outcomes or whatever and uh, I think that there are many people at ISI who definitely have emphasis on you know the methodologies and understand these techniques and can build tools but I think there are also others who might be interested in you know perhaps learning about the impact uh, of the of the techniques tools and uh, um, technologies that they you know perhaps contribute developing and mm -hmm. um, they have the expertise and the knowledge to provide perhaps some journalists with uh, I don't know tips or you know pointing at directions that are worth looking at so what 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 would you tell to the to those you know folks uh how it's a good uh, how could what what could be a good way to start thinking about these problems? Well, one of the things that I'm really hoping to do is to convine is to convene a meeting with um, journalists from some of our media partners. There are, there are some very <laughs> large, well-known news organizations such as the Associated Press and Reuters, um, ProPublica, others who have agreed to be our partners, um, and you know that has. Uh, specific definition of what the partner is. But for right now, mm -hmm. what, what, what matters is that we could convene a relatively small group of journalists in this space to come with their questions and ideas that they have and to hear from you ideas and maybe questions that you're interested in. Think about what stories we might look at and what capabilities there might be for actually investigating those stories. So it's really my dream to bring the two sets of practitioners together to host, in my, in my original vision is somewhat small groups, you know, maybe five journalists or something at a time, so that it is, uh, so that it's not unwieldy and that we can leave with some specific action steps. So that's, that's in my mind how I think about this working. But if people have better ideas, I'm, I'm certainly open to hearing other thoughts on that. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Luca has his hand up. Luca. Hi, hi, Mark. Uh, I'm Luca. I'm a postdoc here at ISI working with, with Emilio. Um, Thank you for the insightful talk, first of all. It's, it's been great, and I loved your examples of investigations. Um, and you showed, you showed us some examples of how we can help you, journalists. But, I, cannot, but I, I think everybody here can also think about ways you can help us. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of uh, examples. You said uh, you talked about capabilities to find interesting stories. Even, even though you said it's it's challenging, I think this is one potential interesting direction and one potential potential interesting uh, help uh, towards our data driven investigation, for instance. And the second one is to find data that go beyond online platforms, social media, and other traditional means that we always use in our domains. And I can think about. Um, um, individuals or people in, in, in distress or denied environment, uh, like authoritarian regime, uh, was voice is always obscured or censored. Uh, we have projects like trying to uh, understand more uh, and to, to, to get insights or signals for, from these specific yeah. scenarios, and it's very difficult. So you, you, for instance, mentioned the use of data from phone calls or photos shared on different platforms. And that I think is, is extremely helpful. Uh, and now I go to, to, to my question, which is connected to the use of this media. You also mentioned like uh, using photos and metadata and the, the, or the possibility to manufacture or modify photo with AI. Uh, so what are your strategy and methodologies to uh, Identi identify uh, accurate or truth uh, data or through through um, uh, multimedia content, uh, which of course can be manufactured and then 
uh, yeah. modified for some purposes. So right now, I have to tell you that we're pretty concerned about this um, because I don't think anybody really knows how we're going to do that in the age of AI generated as they get better and better. I can tell you how we do it now. If a photograph comes out, we can find, um, you know, through reverse image search and other basic tools, which I'm sure you know and use all the time, we can quickly find out whether that image has been posted before through geolocation. We can tell where that image was taken. So for example, oftentimes we would debunk, you know, this, I don't know, this photograph shows, you know, the school shooting at Evalde. But in fact, it doesn't show the school image in Evalde. It shows some other image or whatever, or people, this, this is a really fun one. Um, candidates in ads will show something that's supposed to be very American, but in fact, like it's from Russia or China or something like that. And we're able to sort of with reverse image searching and that kind of thing, find it. Um, we can tell now whether many images have been created by AI because there are flaws in those images, like the earlobes look weird, the hands are really hard to get right. There's a famous image of, a famous, relatively famous image of Boris um, Johnson dancing. I don't know if you've seen it, he's supposedly break dancing. And it looks pretty realistic. Like, it, like when I first saw it, I was like, oh, that's like pretty good. But if you look carefully at the hands, they're like really kind of weird and misshapen. So we can do things like that now, but two years from now, when they have Boris Johnson break dancing, or God only knows what's going to come out in the 2024 election campaign between whoever the Republican and whoever the Democrat is, I think it's going to be really hard. And I don't think we have a good answer. And that's one of the reasons why we are all very concerned about and trying to figure out how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I don't see any more questions. Mark, this is really a, a terrific talk. I really appreciate you taking the time today to tell us about all how this stuff works it, and really interesting stuff. So thank well, you. Thank you for okay. joining. It's been an honor and such a pleasure. And thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye.